Good evening, everyone. My name is Doug Levitt with Neutrina here, and I am joined by our folks at Orange Madison Co-op, as well as our, our guests. Um, I wanted to just forwardly <coughs> announce that this meeting is being recorded for future references for Orange Madison Co-op, so uh, that you're all aware of this when you're asking questions, whether it's in our chat feature, which you'll see, um, or uh, verbally, we'll have question and answer at the uh, at the conclusion of this. Again, my name is Doug Levitt. I'm an equine and field rep here with uh, Neutrina. I'm joined tonight with um, Nathan Holloway, who is one of our uh, species specialists as well as a uh, retail specialist. Uh, David Babor, part of our team, and uh, Kevin Powell and Serena Hare from Orange Madison. And our speaker tonight is uh, Twain Lockhart, who is a poultry specialist and very well renowned uh, gentleman in the field of poultry science as well as uh, just general poultry knowledge. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to uh, Kevin uh, Powell for a minute or so, so he can introduce some things and, and talk about what's going on at Orange Madison. I'll put up the slide deck now. I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Kevin Powell. I'm a territory feed sales manager for Orange Madison Cooperative. Um, those of you that don't know about Orange Madison, we're a member-owned cooperative with locations spread throughout Central Virginia. We have a store in Orange, a store in Madison, and a store in Louisa. We also have a petroleum distribution site in Charlottesville. Uh, we do everything from providing heat, oil, and off-road fuel to your home and business, to spreading lime and fertilizer in your fields, to providing feed and supplies for your large-scale operation or smaller-scale farms. And since we're talking about poultry, one of our biggest attractions at our farm stores right now are our chicks, and definitely would be a great addition to any backyard farm. Um, also want to make everyone aware, you do not have to be a member to shop at Orange Madison Co-op. You can pull up to any of our stores, go right in and shop as you please. So if you have any questions about feed or about our stores, please feel free to contact me by email and I'll make that available in the chat. All right, Twain, it's all up to you. Well, thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm glad you could join us. I really appreciate you spending some time with us. Um, whether you're brand new to chickens, maybe it's your second year, maybe you're an old hand at it. Hopefully you'll pick up some stuff. I pick up stuff all the time. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So let's start off with some commonly asked questions. Uh, I know it's kind of silly, but I, I promise you there's someone out there watching this right now that's wondering this uh, and they're afraid to ask. And by the way, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Uh, I will not laugh at you. I will not make fun of you. We were all new at one time. I was just new a whole lot of years ago. Um, so my number one question I still get asked all the time is, well, I want to have chickens and I want to get eggs, but I can't have a rooster. It doesn't make any sense. Well, you don't need a rooster to get eggs. You just need a rooster to get baby chicks. So the next question, well, are they noisy? Well, I'll refer back to question one. Most of your noise complaints are going to come from a rooster. Your neighbors will listen to your dog bark 24-7, never say a word. A rooster crows twice, they're on the phone. That's just how that works. So most of your noise complaints come from a rooster. But we've established you really don't have to have one of those. Now, do they cause rodents? No, not at all. But the feed can cause issues. So it's much easier to prevent rodents than it is to fight them off. And by the way, if chickens and rodents cross paths, uh, the rodents are on the menu. Your chickens will eat a mouse if they can catch them. They'll eat young rats if they can catch them. The problem is chickens are diurnal, meaning they run around during the daytime, and rodents are nocturnal. They're running around at night, and they don't cross paths too often. So the big key here is preventive a preventive measure keep them out of your feed keep your feed in a metal trash can with a lid on it this will really reduce the odds of them getting into your feed now here's a tip people forget about this you know those feeders that we hang from the ceiling those galvanized feeders well a rodent will climb down that cable or that chain at night and get in that feeder uh, the rule of thumb we call it chicken math there's a fun chicken math we don't have time to go into that but the real chicken math is your chickens should go through about five pounds of feed per month per chicken. Give or take a little bit, but that's pretty easy math. Ten chickens should be about a bag of feed a month, about 50 pounds a month. 
if you're getting through it, going through a lot more than that, pretty good chance you're feeding, you know, rats, mice, squirrels, maybe a lot of wild birds, none of which are your friends. So preventative measures, take that feeder, put it on a clip so it hangs on a clip so you can take that off at night and put that in a trash can with a lid on it too. You'd be surprised once you take away that feed source, yet your rodents go away too. So next slide, please. You know, they, any livestock, if you don't keep them clean, you can have flies, but a lot of horse people get chickens to actually reduce the flies because the chickens scratch around in the poop and eat the larva. Uh, then we eat the eggs, but that's beside the point. It won't hurt you. Uh, so generally speaking, no, they don't cause a fly issue. The manure, yeah, you can use it uh, as a fertilizer, uh, but it's pretty hot. It's pretty high in nitrogen. You need to compost it. Uh, they say about six months, compost that good. Uh, what's neat is if you're using shavings or straw in your coop, that makes it compost really, really well. Just perfect for the garden. Next slide. How many should you get? I joke that I stay up late at night and I came up with the perfect number. Y'all need to get 72 chickens. That would make me very happy. That would make Madison Orange Co-op very happy. We would all be happy, but it's not very realistic. Uh, the rule of thumb is a one chicken per family member will keep you in eggs. So family of four, four chickens. Well, there is a few things that you don't do. You don't get one chicken. Chickens are flock animals. One chicken by itself, they become very neurotic. They don't do well. Uh, they're not generally real healthy. They don't lay very well. So two chickens are okay. The problem with two is if something happens to one, you're down to that lonely number. So, you know, four to six is a, is a good starting point for most people. Also, you may want to see what your local ordinances are. If you don't know how to find that out, your local 4-H, your local ag extension or Madison Co-op may, may be able to tell you that right off the top of your, their head. So how many eggs should, will you get? That's a loaded question. Uh, every breed of chicken is a little different. Uh, your production layers, things like Rhode Island Reds, Plymouth Fard Rocks, you know, you're looking about 250 eggs a year. Uh, sex links, leggerns, uh, you're about 300 eggs a year. You get into some of your fancy breeds, you're down to maybe 20 or 30 eggs a year. So it's kind of all over the map. Also, the older chickens get, they taper down. So the first two years are the best. Then after that, they taper down in the production. At about five or six years, they usually will stop laying on you. We, we call it henna paws. A lot of times they don't survive that. Uh, many times they do though. And you'll have these girls running around that don't lay eggs anymore, but uh, they're still running around. At our, our house that we keep them, they all have names. As long as the wife didn't catch one eating eggs, which is a real nasty habit. They die of old age. Um, they eat bugs still, and they don't eat that much, about five pounds of feed a month. Next slide. So you're gonna need a few things to get started in this hobby. Uh, you're going to need the baby chicks. They're not very expensive. You're going to need a, a brooder. That is basically a container that you're going to put the chicks in. The, the chicks can't con um, regulate their own body temperature. So they need somebody to do it for them. And nature, the mother hen does it. You're going to do it for them. You're going to put them in a box, a stock tank, plastic tote with a heat lamp and some bedding and their feed and their water. And off you go. It's not difficult. That brooder guard thing, I wish I would take that out of this. That's for turkeys and game birds. Baby chickens uh, are pretty good. They don't generally lean up against the, the heat lamp and burn themselves. Turkeys, yeah, they, they might. Um, I'm a pine shavings guy as far as the bedding. Uh, and I like to put newspaper down. Uh, and, and then it makes it easier when you're ready to clean it. You could just kind of roll it up, but like a big nasty burrito. Uh, and if you do that every day or so, it really does not get that smelly. Um, so uh, if you have little kids, little kids and baby chicks go together, but newly hatched baby chicks are pretty delicate. So for the first week to 10 days, don't let them handle them too much. Just because, you know, the nature of a little kid, you put something in their hand, they're going to want to squeeze it. And if they squeeze a baby chick, it can actually uh, hurt them pretty bad, might even kill them. So we don't want that. But after the first week, 10 days, yeah, have at it. Let the kids hold them. Uh, just make sure they, they wash your hands. Uh, and here, I know this is going to sound like conspiracy theory stuff, and you'll see it on the Facebook groups. 
oh, the egg industry doesn't, you know, they don't want you to have chickens, so they, they pass out this stuff. No, they don't. They don't care if you have chickens, trust me. They're going to, you'll see things about not kissing your chickens. That There's no conspiracy theory. That's real. Please don't kiss your chickens. Uh, it is a low percentage chance that you'll get sick, that you'll get salmonella. But you don't want to play with that. Salmonella is real nasty. I've never had it, but I've known people that have had it. The rule of thumb is the first week you think you're going to die. The second week you wish you would die. It's supposed to be like the worst stomach flu you've ever had. So you don't want to mess with that. Wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer. Not trying to scare you, but please don't kiss your chickens. That, that really is kind of a thing with people, and they think it's a conspiracy theory. It's not. Next slide, please. So... I like to tell you to get ready first, get your get your uh, setup all up and running before you bring the chicks home. That way you don't have to make multiple trips to the co-op. Uh, you know, you just get it all up and running and everything but the baby chicks. And then bring the chicks home and you're off and running. That way you make sure your lamp's running good and just you have it all. Next slide, please. By the way, go back one slide. I missed a spot there. Okay. It says you need to hold them for two weeks. That's not true. Whoever did this PowerPoint, she was a fan of going from a small container to a medium container to a big container, which you can do, but she doesn't specify that. You're going to put them in this uh, brooding system for about six weeks. They're going to be in this for about six weeks till they're fully feathered, and they need to be indoors. Now, whether you do them in the house or not, that's up to you. The CDC doesn't like you doing them in the house because of uh, salmonella, but everybody does it. I've been raising chickens for over 50 years. I've never gotten salmonella. I've never burned down the house, okay? So it's up to you. A lot of people like to do them in the garage. I'm just throwing it out there. If you do have anybody in your, in your household that has asthma, maybe you should do them in the garage because uh, they do create dander, and that can be kind of hard on somebody with respiratory issues. So next slide, please. So wooden cardboard box. Uh, cardboard box is my least favorite because that heat lamp falling down into those shavings is a fire hazard. Not trying to scare you. Again, I've brooded thousands of baby checks in cardboard boxes, never burned down the house. Um, but wooden box might be better. Plastic is even better yet. It's not quite as flammable. A stock tank is awesome if you have one. Even a big wash tub. Uh, the brooder guard, again, ignore that. That's more for turkeys and game birds. Next slide. All right. So if you are going to do them outside, let's say you're going to do them in the garage. A couple of tips here. You might want to get a second lamp and put that out there. You can put them on both ends. That way they can get away from them if they get too hot. But if something as simple as the, the lamp burns out, the bulb burns out, your chicks don't freeze. Another old trick that we've done for years is, uh, or people have done, because I do mine in the house, but a lot of people tell me if they brew them in the garage, they will put a baby monitor. Many of you may have one of those laying around. Put a baby monitor on them. I Trust me, if that lamp burns out, those chickens are going to tell you. They scream their little heads off. So you'll know something's wrong, but if you don't have any kind of a monitor on them, you won't know it and you might lose them. So says 90 to 95 degrees, that's ideal, but you don't really need a thermometer. If you want to, you can, but the baby chicks will tell you if they get too cold, they get under the lamp. If they get too hot, they move away from it. It's pretty simple. Next slide, please. That graphic shows that the little yellow dots are the baby chicks. Perfect is right there in the right-hand corner. They're kind of running around, making little peepee, -pee, happy, contented noises. When they first come in from the hatchery, they're real loud. They've been traveling through the postal system. They're disoriented for about the first four to six hours. They're not happy campers, but they settle in pretty quick. If there's something wrong, they'll tell you. It's usually I'm hot, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. It's one of the big four. So it, otherwise, they're not that big a nuisance. They're not that noisy. Uh, if you clean them every day or so, they're not that smelly. I will say, and I don't know the mechanics of it, you don't want to set them up in a draft. So you don't want to set them up right in the door. Every time you open the door, they get a draft. It does something to their immune system and you'll start losing chicks. That's why most of your feed stores, you'll see, they have the chicks in the back of the store. It's, it's not to make you walk through the whole store like a casino where you have to walk through everything. It's so they're not in a draft. Next slide, please. All right. 
So I I prefer when you first get started, I like to see you use the little quart size waterers. You can use the gallon ones, but the quart size don't take up near as much room in your brooding tank. Um, another tip, my wife broods hundreds of chicks every single season. She almost never loses any chicks. And I think the secret to that one of them is she uses bottled water for about the first week. And it doesn't have to be Avion or anything like that. Just purified drinking water. Your tap water has chlorine in it. And that is a variable. You don't know how much chlorine's in there. You don't know what that's doing to those baby chicks. Now, that being said, the difference between a day old chick and two weeks old or even 10 days old is night and day as far as durability. New chicks are kind of delicate, but they get durable pretty quick. But let's help them out that first 10 days or so. Maybe give them bottled water, do the vitamins and electrolytes in there for the first three to five days. And that really reduces your loss. It re re losses. It reduces the stress level. Um, if you're getting your chicks from, from uh, Madison Orange, don't worry about this part because they will get the chicks started for you. But if you do order directly from the hatchery, you're going to want to hydrate those chicks before you feed them. Chickens are pretty amazing. You know, they can go three days without eating or drinking because they're living on the yolk. That's how they can ship them from coast to coast through the mail. Well, what happens is when you feed those chicks when they first come in, it mixes with that yolk and it creates a very, very sticky feces, a very sticky poop. And it creates a condition called pasty butt. If you hydrate those chicks first and let them flush that out, it reduces that tremendously. I'm not going to say it eliminates it, but it reduces it tremendously. You know, it's one thing if you have one chick out of 25 that gets pasty butt, but, you know, to have 15 out of 25, it's a lot of work. And what it is is it creates kind of a, a, a shell, almost like concrete, over their little vent, and they can't go to the bathroom. If you don't correct that, they'll die. Now, don't just peel that off. You need to take a, warm, a paper towel with warm water, hold it on there for about five minutes, and it will dissolve off and come off. If you just tear it off, you might tear their vent, uh, which they can bleed out. Also, under the best of conditions, just tearing that off. You're going to stress that baby chick. And at that age, at one or two or three days old, stressing her, you may have just relegated her to the bottom of the pecking order for the rest of her life. Because you stressed her, she's going to grow just a little bit slower than the rest of her buddies and she's going to not have a happy life after that so don't do that to her just spend five minutes with a paper towel and warm water next slide please if it continues and it's a kind of a chronic thing you could take a little dab of vaseline and put it around the vent and then they won't they won't stick anymore all right so your new baby chicks you've got them home you're going to feed them just free feed them cool thing about chickens is they self-regulate they're not like me they know when to stop eating uh the exception would be your meat chickens we'll get into those a little bit later they're almost like a different species but everything else whether they be bantams or laying hens or fancies they you free feed them give them as much as they want you're going to give them as much chick starter feed as they want for the first 16 weeks now it says six weeks is critical yeah okay the first six weeks is kind of critical you're laying the groundwork for that chicken's entire life so you don't want to skimp and cut corners on your baby chick feed feed a good quality chick feed uh but realistically go ahead and feed them that for the whole 16 weeks a good quality chick feed uh and then you're going to go to a layer feed after the chick feed next slide please so your timeline is the first five to six weeks, you're going to have them in the house or in the garage or in some sort of a building. You're going to be brooding them. Um, and don't go by the, the calendar, go by the chicken when you move them out. You need that chicken to be fully feathered, okay? So I don't care if that chicken's eight weeks old, old if it still has down on it, it's not time to go outside. Also, you need to pick a day that's relatively nice. Don't put them outside in the middle of an ice storm or something. And you're not just going to fling them outside. That's a common mistake people make. They bring home these baby chicks. They brood them. They do a wonderful job. And they just let them loose. And they're on the phone calling the feed store saying, my chickens, something made them. They're gone. Somebody stole them. They don't know where home is. So something to know is about six weeks after you bring these little fluff balls home, you're going to need a coop to put them in. And that's going to be your big outlay of money. That's where the outlay of money goes. It's not in everything else. Everything else is real inexpensive. So just know 
about six weeks downstream, you're going to need a coop because even if you're going to free range these girls, they need to go in that coop for a couple of weeks so they know where home is. Then you can start letting them out and, and they'll come in at night. So seven to 10 weeks, you can start integrating with an existing flock. Um, I think we, do we have slides coming up about exactly how to do that? I don't want to cover that if we have slides, do you know? I think we do. 16 weeks, you're going to go to a layer feed. They're going to be on that for the rest of their life. So you're not going to get eggs at 16 to 24 weeks. I see that all the time. Trust me, if you get eggs at 16 weeks, I want you to call Madison Co-op and have them call me. And I want to see this with my own eyes. They always say this, and it's, I don't know why they say this. You're not going to get eggs at 16 weeks. It's going to be more like 22 to 26 weeks. OK, I don't want to set any unfair expectations. You start feeding them a layer feed at 16 weeks to pump up the calcium in her system so that she uh, has enough calcium to produce eggs effectively. Next slide, please. So this is going to be your your biggest single outlay of money right here. And this is your personal choice. I'm going to give you some tips here, mistakes that I've made over the years, um, and try to help you out here. It, you can spend anywhere from a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, you could build something yourself. You can repurpose a, a a kid's playhouse or a tool shed. There's there's many options. Okay, the the picture in this this coop in this picture is a pretty good design. It was designed so you can get the eggs from the outside. That's what that flap is in the front. So you open that up and that's where the nest boxes are. You don't even have to go inside to get get the eggs. This is a nice design. A tip I will give you is even with a design like this, design your coop so you can walk inside of it. This makes life oh so much easier. Now I live in Wisconsin and let me tell you, there's nothing like climbing on your hands and knees in the snow to get two eggs out of a coop or four eggs out of a coop. Uh, after about the third time you do that, you're not going to want to do it anymore, and you're going to start leaving the eggs outside. They're going to freeze. They're going to crack. The chickens discover what's inside, and they may start eating eggs. So it's kind of a whole thing. So you want to keep that in mind when you're designing your coop. You want to have it designed where it's easy to pick up the eggs. Also, let's say you do have a design where you can get the eggs from the outside. You want to be able to go in and look at your chickens once in a while. Uh, you want to pick them up every once in a while, see what their body conditions like, see if they have any external parasites, that kind of thing. So having a coop design that you can walk in is a good design. The latches on this, you want to have that design so you can put something on there, either a complicated clip or even a padlock. Raccoons are really, really clever. Uh, we joke about it. They take night courses on how to pick locks and open up you know, lasps and all that kind of stuff. They're very, very clever. So, you know, one bad night and you can lose your whole flock. Uh, they're probably public enemy number one in most places. Um, one of the big, biggest, if not the biggest misnomer in this hobby is a thing called chicken wire. Chicken wire keeps chickens in, but it doesn't keep predators out, specifically raccoons. A raccoon can stick his nasty little jazz hands right through chicken wire, grab your chicken by the throat, and try and pull her throat. He doesn't succeed, so then he gets frustrated and he kills all the witnesses. So, like I said, one bad night, you can lose your whole flock. You want to use something called hardware cloth. They're little squares. Raccoon can't get his nasty little paws through that. And when you put that, if you're making the coop yourself, here's another tip. Don't just use a staple gun. Raccoon can peel that off. Use those U-shaped nails. It takes you a, a while longer to do, but they can't just peel those off like they can with a staple gun. So next slide, please. All right, so five, five weeks is pretty early, but you know, it depends on the breed. Every once in a while, you'll get one that's really feathered out quickly. You want them to be feathered out, not downy when they go outside. Uh, as I said, you don't just fling them outside, put them in the coop. I'm not a big fan of putting a heat lamp in the coop at all. <clears throat> and and while we're on that subject, just really quick, I don't know how cold you got. Um, two years ago, we got down to 45 below. We do not heat our coop. We do not have insulation in our coop. We did not lose a single chicken. 
uh, last week, or was it week before, we got down to 18 below. We did not lose <clears throat> a single chicken. So you really don't need to, you don't need to heat that coop, all right? It, it's uh, a fire hazard. People burn their coops down every year. Um, chickens do not metabolize cold the same way humans do, or the same way mammals do, I should say. Um, you know, you might be looking outside and go, God, my dog would be so cold out there. Yeah, he would be. But a chicken, as long as they're kept dry, and that is the key, you must keep them dry and out of the elements. You know, here, here's something to think about. It can be 30 below zero, and you'll still see little birds flying around outside. They're doing just fine. And they don't have the body mass a chicken has. So a chicken's even warmer than those little birds. So as long as they're kept dry, they do great. Chickens deal with cold way better than they deal with heat. Heat's a bigger issue for them than, than the cold, okay? So let's get back on track. Um, And the first few nights, you're going to want to count them. Make sure everybody's coming into the coop at night. If they're not, find them and stick them in there because they're creatures of habit. So that first night, if you can't find them and they're sleeping in the tree, you know, and right outside or something, grab them and stick them in the coop. Make them sleep in the coop. They get the message pretty quick. So uh, I, we still need the slide to advance. There we go. So. Introducing chicks uh, <laughs> to the to an existing flock. So those of you that got chickens last year, you want to add some to the flock, please do not go down to the co-op and buy some baby chicks and bring them home and stick them in the coop. It's not a Disney movie. Nobody's going to magically develop a maternal instinct. In fact, if you have kids, you can't unring this bell. You can't unsee it. <sighs> Guys, they'll probably be on the menu. Uh, if the chicks don't belong to those adult chickens, they'll probably eat them. And, and it's pretty disturbing. So please don't do that. But you can introduce juvenile chickens into the flock. So you've brooded them, in, let's say, in the garage or the house for the first six weeks. And you can move them out into the coop. They've effectively been quarantined. Um, but don't just put them in the coop. You can, but you're just going to have a lot of drama. You know, your chicken coop, if you've never had chickens before, and maybe those of you that, that do can relate to this, think of a classroom full of middle school girls. They thrive on drama. Chickens thrive on drama. They're very, very similar. So bringing out a bunch of, you know, juvenile chickens, it's kind of like bringing out a bunch of seventh graders and you have eighth and ninth graders in the coop already. So they're going to dominate them. They're going to pick on them. But you can uh, take a step to reduce that drama. What I have found that works very well is we take the juvenile chickens, put them in a wire dog crate, feed them and water them in that uh, for about two weeks. But you're going to put that in the coop. So you're going to feed them and water them in the coop so the big girls can see them, but they can't get to them. Um, then after about two weeks, one evening, take the juveniles out, put them up on the perch next to the adult chickens, let them all wake up together. No, they're not going to wake up one big happy family. In fact, you're going to have some drama, but you've probably reduced it quite a bit. Also, that very first morning, that night, I like to put a little scratch down. So that very first morning, the big girls wake up and they're kind of distracted by, by the yummy stuff on the floor. Now, don't make a habit of doing that every night. You don't want to leave feet on the ground at night because you'll get rodents. But one night, you can get away with it. Put a little scratch down for that first night. That helps. You're going to need to add food and water stations because sometimes the big girls won't let the little ones drink and eat, especially drink. This is a big deal. Um, you're also, your little guys are still going to be on baby food for the first 16 weeks. The adults are on the adult food. Generally, they may mix a little bit, more or less. It's usually the adults will eat the baby food. It's kind of a dominance thing. That's why it's so important to have uh, oyster shell. The baby food has virtually no calcium. I have to pause here just one second. Sorry, I was having a cat issue. Uh, anyway, the, the adult chickens will eat the baby chicken feed a little bit. Not going to hurt them as long as they have oyster shell available as a calcium supplement. So you may also want to take what a lot of people do is they will take uh, sheets of plywood and lean them up against the coop on the inside, a couple of spots. 
kind of creating a little safe haven so the young girls can get in there, but the big ones can't follow them. Uh, also having a rooster. Um, you know, rooster, uh, you don't need one, but he is sort of the voice of reason in the coop. Uh, and he may help settle this pecking order issue. So, but for most of you, that's not a good enough reason to get a rooster. The negatives outweigh that. But if you already have one, you may find that he's going to help a little. Next slide, please. So we, we pretty much, I think I kind of covered all this. Uh, not all. You don't want to overcrowd your birds. At the end of the day, when it's all said and done, you need about four square feet per chicken ground space, okay? Uh, and I say the ground space, you can't just do total cubic feet because they can't hover, they can't live on the perches. Uh, they need to have about three to four square feet, ideally four square feet per chicken. If you exceed that, if you have more chickens than that, the world will not end, the moon and stars will not fall from the sky, but they get in trouble. When you overcrowd chickens, a lot of things happen and none of them are good. They may start feather picking, they may start egg eating. So you wanna watch that. You don't wanna overcrowd them too much. If you bring in adult birds or juvenile birds outside of something you brooded yourself. Now, remember I said you effectively quarantine these birds. They came from the hatchery sterile environment. You've had them quarantined for six weeks in your house or your garage. Then you move them out, so they're safe. They've not been around anything. You go to a poultry swap and bring home some chickens. Well, you need to quarantine those for about 30 days away from your flock. They can look perfectly healthy at that swap and you bring them home and two weeks downstream or th three weeks downstream, all your chickens are sick. You may bring home something you didn't count on. Uh, and then maybe it may be, oh, my buddy has chickens and he, he has a really clean operation. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, he may. But the stress of moving those birds from his house to your house may cause those chickens to get sick, make all your chickens sick. Trust me, you don't think it can happen to you, but it can quarantine any juvenile or adult birds coming in off your property. Not the baby chicks coming from the co-op. Remember, you're going to quarantine them when you bird them. Next slide. Next slide, we kind of covered all that. All right. I think we covered all that too, to be honest with you. Uh, pecking order, you'll hear that term all the time. Uh, it's just part of flock life. You know, you have your alpha. Usually the rooster is the alpha, he's in charge. Then you'll have an alpha hen. She's number two, she's right behind him. If you don't have a rooster, the alpha hen runs the flock. And it, it's numerical, it goes, you know, if you have 10 chickens, you all the way down, number one, number two, number three, all the way down to the bottom, number 10, or if you want to count the other way. Um, and that's just the nature of chickens. Uh, no matter what you do, you're going to have a pecking order. And it can seem very, very cruel, but that's just how they operate. Um, it's a uh, flock mentality. The flock's only as strong as the weakest member. So sometimes if they have a weak member they don't like, they may try to vote her off the island. Uh, I'm just telling you, not trying to scare you, but it does happen. Uh, okay, so switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about ducks. Uh, next slide. So you don't ever brood ducklings with baby chickens or anything else. Uh, ducklings tend to be very messy. They they don't really play in the water. They have to keep their nasal membranes wet and their mucous membranes wet. So it appears like they're playing in the water. Um, so they end up flipping water all over the place. If you have chickens or pheasants or anything else in there with them, they get wet, they get chilled, and they die. So you don't ever brood waterfowl with anything else. <clears throat> if you're going to brood ducks, just brood them by themselves. A life-changing moment for me was a couple years ago, discovered, somebody told me, see, I tell you, I learn stuff all the time. A couple years ago, somebody said, oh, yeah, you just put a couple of pee-pee pads down below the shavings. That was a life-changing event, okay? It made brooding ducks so much easier they were so much less messy um but other than that you kind of feed them and do them the same way the one big tip i would tell you never ever feed your ducklings medicated chick feed the medication is not approved for them and it can cause uh, serious health issues with ducklings so you don't feed the medicated uh, feed to them next slide please so you're going to find they are messier. They do go through more water. You're also going to find they grow 
crazy fast. Ducks just grow really, really fast. They're a lot of fun. They have a lot of personality. Um, next slide. Same thing, bottled water, just like with your chickens. Chicken, ducks tend to be a little tougher. They tend to have really strong immune systems. Um, but same thing, bottled water just helps reduce your losses. Um, again, do not mix the species. Next slide. They put the chow away. They eat, they eat quite a bit more than chickens do. They do have different nutritional requirements. So, I mean, in theory, you can feed them a chicken food, but it's not right. Um, your male ducks will have a real problem with layer feed. Um, and you, you may never hear anything about this because unless you take that dead bird and have a, a necropsy, that's a $10 word for an autopsy on a duck. Uh, unless you have a necropsy done, you don't know, you know, you just have a dead bird. Uh, there's too much calcium in, in chicken layer feed for ducks, especially the males. Um, they need a higher niacin level for their legs. Um, they need about 18% protein, depends on which duck breeder you talk to, uh, and the lower calcium levels. Next slide, please. Um, this bird has a condition called angel wing. It's from too fast a growth, it's from, feeding probably a non-duck specific product to this bird and it was too high a protein at a critical juncture in time but it can also be a genetic issue there's a couple of factors that can cause this it's from the wings growing too fast and they twist it's very hard to correct so this is also why you want to feed a duck specific product if possible next slide please so we developed one we had several nationally known duck breeders that show ducks all over the country. They helped us. They had several bullet points. We interviewed them separately. And you know what? All those bullet points overlapped. They all wanted the same thing. Maybe not quite in the same order, but they all wanted the same thing. They wanted the lower calcium, the higher niacin. They wanted pre and probiotics. They also wanted small, hard pellets. Okay, so they hold up in the water. They're also, they also mentioned that ducks are very sensitive to mycotoxins. That's the mold that occurs in grain. Chickens and turkeys are pretty tough. It, it, they seem to get away with uh, eating that without too much in the way of ill effects. Ducks are pretty sensitive to it. So we formulated this duck feed for lower mycotoxin levels. And where this will come into play is when you have people breeding ducks, they'll get much higher hatch rates, uh, much higher survivability rates on the baby ducks. So it also has animal protein in it. And ducks are not vegetarians, uh, they're omnivores, and they just flourish better having a little animal protein in their, in their diet. So we hit all the bullet points that these guys wanted. Uh, by the way, this feed is taken off in the, in the poultry show world. It is rocking and rolling. Uh, we have a duck in New York, in upstate New York, that's gonna be on the postage stamp coming out in May uh, on the Heritage Breed um, Forever Stamps. Uh, that duck is a Cayuga duck named Anubis. And of all the duck feeds in, in the world, they've been feeding the Country Feeds ducks since it launched, and that's what he eats. So we're pretty proud of that, actually. Next slide. So I got to throw a disclaimer out. Technically, you're really, you know, from a biosecurity standpoint, you're really not supposed to mix species, uh, but everybody does it. And I'll give you a, a prime example of this, what I'm talking about. I've heard for my whole life that you never mix turkeys and chickens because chickens can give your turkeys blackhead, okay? Been raising them together for 50 years. I have never seen blackhead. I've seen it in books, but I've never actually seen it. But that still doesn't make it right, okay? Um, if I was raising turkeys commercially, I would not want a chicken in the same zip code because it would wipe out the family farm. If you have four turkeys and they get blackhead and they die, it's probably not gonna put you into bankruptcy, okay? Do, do, do you see the kind of the difference on a commercial versus a, a backyard level? Uh, you know, technically right is right. You're really not supposed to mix species uh, because of the biosecurity and the diseases. Ducks, just gonna say it, ducks tend to spread a lot of things. They never seem to get sick, but they can make everybody else sick. So to manage a multi-species flock, ideally you don't really want them sleeping together and cooping up together. This may be very difficult to do, but in an ideal situation, especially having the waterfowl getting everybody else wet, th this can really be a problem. 
Also, ducks, if they don't have, if the drakes don't have enough hens, uh, they're not above uh, getting a little too amorous with your chickens, and they can really hurt your chickens pretty badly. So you really don't want to go down that road. Uh, it's kind of disturbing for the kids. So just saying, um, you know, yes, you can manage multi-species flock. Ideally, you want to kind of keep them separate if possible. Next slide. So that left us about 15 minutes for, for questions. Uh, if I didn't cover it at all, that's OK. Anything poultry, maybe even a species I didn't cover. Uh, let me know if it's had feathers. I've probably raised it at one time or another, including guineas and emus and just about everything. Pheasants. I didn't say I was good at those, but I have tried. Hey, Twain, I had a question come in. Um, OK. Somebody has some guineas and they were wondering if you can mix really guineas in poultry or chickens, I guess. And uh, they just want okay, to now you're going to make a liar out of me. OK, because I just said you're not supposed to mix species, but they'll actually recommend that you mix guineas with chickens. So uh, the reason why is your chickens have a very, very strong home in homing instinct. Once they know where home is, they like to stay home. They, they, they'll they wander, and, and I'm sure there's somebody out there going, mine don't, mine, well, for the most part, though, they like to be able to see their coop. And then sometimes they they get comfortable with that, and it's a, it's a landmark. Well, it's the house next to the coop. As long as they can see the house, they're good. So they may wander, you know, a certain amount of, uh, uh, of distance. Guineas, oh, my God. Guineas may go on walkabout. They may stick around for two years and then one day just decide to go and walk about and you never see them again. They're kind of known for that. They say that, and I, I've done this, if you raise guineas with chickens, the Keats with the baby chicks, they bond with the baby chicks and they stay home. I've run into people and a year later they'll tell me, you know, we did that. You're full of crap. They act like they hate each other. Do you still have them? Well, yeah. I said, well, I may be full of crap, but I'm not that full of crap. Uh, they're still home. They may act like they don't like them, but they still kind of bonded with them and they stuck around. That's the theory anyway. Guineas are great watchdogs. Um, they kill snakes. They're really good at eating ticks. Uh, the downside every day is an Easter egg hunt. Um, they don't like to stay home. They, they're not all that fond of coming into the coop at night. They like to sleep up in the trees. They're almost like a wild chicken. Um, does anybody know what a group of guineas is called? It kind of describes guineas. Uh, a group of guineas is called a confusion, and that really kind of describes them. Uh, it's really hard to tell the males from the females, um, but like I say, they're great watchdogs. They eat snakes. Um, I like them. They're real comical, uh, but they're loud. If you don't think your neighbor would appreciate a rooster, don't even contemplate getting guineas because they're louder than a guinea. So, why are we here? Okay, feeding feather fixer year round. That's very, very common in the show world. Uh, they, they actually call feather fixer the king in the show world. It's the king of chicken feeds. It is a top shelf layer feed as well as a molting diet. So yeah, you can definitely feed that year round if you want. Um, the mistake people make with that product is they wait till the chickens are like naked and then they start feeding it and then they call me and they're like, oh, it's not working. Well, it's ideally better if you start it before they go into the molting process and then it really helps speed up the uh, the molting. Uh, and they like it in the show world because it brings in the feathers so much nicer. So any other questions? Twain, could you cover uh you know, anybody wanting to get with the Bantams and okay. mix with the uh, other hens. All right. So Bantams, in case you're not familiar, Bantams are the miniatures of the chicken world. Think of ponies, what a pony is to a horse. Uh, in just about every instance where you have a standard size chicken, there's a Bantam version. They're little, they're cute. They're a lot easier to handle, so they're perfect for little kids, uh, maybe to get kids started in uh, poultry, maybe showing aspects, showmanship, things like that. Now, that being said, the downside to Bantams, they're extremely broody. Broody means they want to be mom, okay? Most of your laying breeds, your standard 
Rhode Island Reds, your Sex Links, your Osterlorps, your Easter Eggers, Plymouth Rocks, they have bred that broodiness out of them. I mean, I'm not going to lie. You, you'll still get one once in a while, but for the most part, they're not broody. They don't want to be mom. And, and being broody is not a good trait for most of you. Uh, let me tell you how this plays out. You come home one day and it's always your favorite chicken. You come home, Betty's gone missing. You're like, oh no, something ain't Betty. So you have a funeral service. You move on. Three weeks later, Betty comes out from under the house with the string of baby chicks. Okay, not the end of the world. Just know that about half of those will be male. Uh, but here's what normally really happens in the real world. Betty goes missing. You have the funeral service. You've moved on. Three months later, your husband or you maybe or whoever is under the house working on the plumbing. And there's Betty sitting on a bunch of rotten eggs because Betty doesn't have a husband. There's no rooster in the zip code. Well, you get broody breeds of chickens, they will sit on the eggs whether there's a rooster around or not. Now, why this is a negative is she hasn't been laying eggs for you. She ruined a whole clutch of eggs. You yank her off that nest right that minute, it'll probably be six to eight weeks before she starts laying again. They get real skinny when they sit on a nest for an extended period of time. So for most of you, being broody is not a real good trait. Bantams, as a, as a rule, are extremely broody. Now, remember, we talked about the middle school classroom full of girls. So what did they do with the kids that were like really little, that were half the size? They picked on them. So if you're going to do bantams, do bantams. If you're going to mix them with the standard size chickens, just know they're probably going to get picked on a little bit. If you have a big area, a big coop where they can get away from the big girls, that's fine. But if they're going to be confined in somewhat close quarters, they may have a kind of a rough time. So just, just throwing that out there, I'm a big fan of Bantams. If you, if you do Bantams, you probably should feed crumbles. And that means, you know, all chickens can eat a pellet. Uh, excuse me. All chickens can eat a crumble, but not all chickens can eat a pellet. So the smaller Bantams will need a crumble feed. Um, and there's, there's really no difference between the crumbles and the pellets. They're made out of the same thing. In fact, they make the crumbles out of the pellets. It's just a different form. So... Hopefully that covered it. Not trying to discourage you from getting Bantams, just wanting you to know what, what kind of the, the shortcomings of them are and, and to have your expectations uh, correct. Any other questions? So you want me to, how about I describe some uh, basic terms real quick? We've got a few minutes. Uh, the one that people get in trouble with is straight run. Um, is it okay if I describe that? Is that uh, it's pretty pretty easy? So you may walk into your farm store and you'll see the tanks full of baby chicks, and you may see pullets and straight run. Those are the, generally the two that you see. And depending on the farm store you walk into, you may ask them. Hey, what's straight run mean? And the associate, you know, he's playing with his phone and he's, oh, well, that means you might get a rooster. That is not what that means, guys. Now, at Madison Co-op, they know what they're talking about, but a lot of places they may not. Do not assume everybody's going to know. Straight run does not mean you might get a rooster. I promise you, you will get roosters if you do straight run. So logic tells you that it should be a 50-50 mix. That's not how this works. It's a 50-50 mix on Bantams because they don't sex those. Uh, and it's a 50-50 mix on your meat chickens because they don't sex those either. On your laying hens, they sex those at the hatchery. They run about 95% accurate. But what happens is, let's say they hatch a thousand Rhode Island red hen or a thousand Rhode Island red chicks. They pull all the sexed orders out first then what's left is your straight run. So that logical 50-50 mix just dropped to like 90-10, 95-5. You're going to get some roosters. So maybe you've already bought some straight run chicks. Don't panic. Just know that about four months downstream, you may hear a little cockadoodle doing. And at about uh, five to six months, uh, they make pretty good. You can eat them, but don't let them get too old. If they go past about six months, the, those chickens turn into... Uh, stew chickens because they get really tough real fast so i tell you what though some of those uh those laying hen breed roosters those are really good eating 
So do we have any other questions? Do we need to leave time to do anything, any housekeeping or anything? Which hatcheries? Um, which one do, do, do you use at the, at the co-op? Is that Mount Healthy or? We use Town. Cackle? Townline. Townline. Oh, I know Townline up in Michigan. Yeah, I know them. They're, that's a good hatchery. They do a lot of their own genetics. They have a lot of their own birds up there, which is not the norm with most hatcheries. So Townline's a good hatchery. I sometimes I just, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Twain. No, um, go ahead. This is Serena Humphrey. I'm with Orange Madison Co-op. I just want to add something in. If we're getting another question, and we'll answer it. Um, there's a giveaway included if you're attending this meeting. So what I plan to do is insert everybody's name in a raffle this evening, and I'll be contacting the winner tomorrow morning and announcing the winner on our Facebook page. So if you don't follow our Facebook page or like it currently, um, you can search it's Orange Madison Cooperative. Um, give us a like and you should be updated when I announce the winner. So thank you. She also asked, somebody asked uh, which hatcheries, plural. I like Cackle, uh, Townline's good, uh, Mount Healthy's pretty good. Um, depending on where you're at, I, I kind of try to stay as close as possible. Uh, I live in Wisconsin, so I use a Wisconsin hatchery, um, but that's not absolutely necessary. But for example, I, I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Let's say you're going to get Silverlace wine ducks. Well, you can get those at pretty much any hatchery. So why would I buy them from a hatchery in California when I can get them one, one state over from where I live? And those chicks are going to be in the mail one day as opposed to three days. So they're going to be a lot less stressed, if that makes sense. Although in some years it comes down to uh, availability and I would go through, and unless you're going to buy a, a large number of them, most hatcheries uh, require you to buy 25. I would go through the co-op because then you don't have to buy that large number, but that's, Hey, that's just me. So. For those of you that are brand new, um, don't overthink it. You took the first good step here. Uh, I like to tell people I'm not all that bright, but I can raise chickens. Uh, don't beat yourself up if you lose one or two. It, it, it's going to happen. It, it happens to the best of us. Uh, the learning curve is pretty fast. There's a lot of info out there. Um, if you do get stuck, you can always get a hold of the co-op. And, and if they don't know the answer, they can get a hold of me. And if I don't know the answer, I know plenty of other chicken people. So uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's not just about getting eggs or raising meat chickens. It, chickens are tons of fun and they're real relaxing. Uh, and you're going to find they're really entertaining. And a lot. that's why a lot of people kind of make pets out of them. They have a lot more personality than you think. So I think you'll really enjoy the hobby. Uh, by the way, there's only one quarterback in the NFL that has chickens, and that's Tom Brady, and he has seven Super Bowl rings. I'm not even a Brady fan, but I think there's a connection. That was well said. <laughs> yeah, I've tried to call Aaron Rodgers. He won't return my calls. I'm probably on some weird watch list now. I'm telling him he needs to get him some chickens. <laughs> We thought you were already on that weird watch list. I am. The, the last three sitting presidents I've written letters to and told them they need to get chickens. And I'm sure nobody writes me back, so I'm sure I'm on some watch list. I think I'm on a watch list within Cardwell, too. Entertaining as ever. Um, well, thank you, Twain, for joining us. And thank you for Orange Mass and Co-op for, for hosting this and putting this on. Um, to be looking out on the Facebook page for for the winner announced tomorrow morning. But if there's anything else, reach out to Kevin, Serena, the Orange Madison Co-op. They got a really good crew there. So please reach out to them. And thank you again, everybody, for jumping on. Yep. Thanks for your time, everybody. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. You too. Stay.